name's Gillian, I'm from the Africa Oxford Initiative, and we're really excited to be one of the sponsors of this amazing summit. I think it's there's obviously been a lot of great discussions that people have had yesterday, and there's still another two days to go. So I'm just here to tell you a bit about what AFOX is. Um, is anyone in the room working within Africa, Africa-focused conservation or anything, just by a show of hands? Okay, great. So, um, yeah, AFOX has been around for about a little over two years now, and it really was set up just so there would be a platform for the various pockets of people who were doing Africa-focused things within the university to actually have a way to connect with each other, identify each other, not only within the university, with researchers and academics on the Af from African institutions as well. So, we have a video to play for you that says it a lot better than I can say it, and it will tell you everything about AFOX and then at the end, um, as in at the end of the conference or the end of the day, if anyone has any questions or wants to find out more about Apple, you can visit our website and we're just on South Parks Road, so you can come and see us anytime. First time I would say in let's say four years that I've been ready to have to work on something of my own other than the routine work that I do. Collaboration in science is very important. The outcome of my presence here in Oxford is that together with my colleagues here we will plan for future field work together and joint laboratory analysis and joint publication of our results. This kind of interaction has been very big I say that research makes the seemingly impossible possible. Research is the game changer for a more sustainable, peaceful, and prosperous society. And your work will also help us conserve our planet. Optimist. Feels good to come out. Um, 
I'm chair of the UCL Species Survival Commission. I'm based in Caracas, in Venezuela, from the headquarters of an NGO called Provita that we founded 33 years ago. And I'm also a professor of ecology at a Venezuelan Institute for Scientific Investigation. But before we have a commercial break, <laughs> You are allowed to take your, the tea and coffee outside of the coffee rooms if you want, but never ever come into room C or B up here with them or to the JCR theater. I can't say what the consequences of that might be. <laughs> Fire exits, they are all indicated and, and labeled. Assembly points for the daytime use are in the main quad. And, um, there are also five, five notices in the bedrooms and backs of doors everywhere. Please, if you see the no tweet symbol on any slide, uh, refrain from tweeting. And if you do not wish, is this the, which are the lanyards, these? Not the green ones, no? Green. Yeah, green. If you do not wish to be photographed, wear this, and uh, people will not photograph you. All right. Well, it's a pleasure and an honor to introduce Alex Dehan, right? <laughs> this morning's plenary speaker. Last week, he and I had a conversation over Skype and talked about his presentation, his career, and his work. And the more that we spoke, the clearer it became to me. So I, said to me I said to myself, Alex is James Bond. He's a conservation James Bond. He does not fight any terrorists or spies, but he's always thinking about creative ways to face some of the biggest enemies that we have for our survival. He even has secret factories full of scientists that produce gadgets to help him get the job done. And he will tell you all about that, so I'm not going to go into more details. He has many accomplishments. He's an ecologist with a PhD in evolutionary biology from the University of Chicago. He's a CEO of Conservation X Labs, an innovation technology startup focused on conservation. He's also the Chandler Innovator at Duke University and professor, professor of the practice at Arizona State University. He most recently served as a chief scientist in USAID. Alex was a founding country director of the Wildlife Conservation Society Afghanistan program and helped create Afghanistan's first uh, national park. He was just telling me this morning about all the wildlife in Afghanistan, which I was completely not familiar with. He tells the story of the establishment of this park in his book, The Snow Leopard Project. Please come to him and buy a copy. <laughs> all the money goes straight into Afghanistan to support conservation projects. During uh, a, conserva uh, a conversation, he made maybe several references to the term crisis and how the environmental crisis as well as other crises fuel innovation. I live in Venezuela, so I know about crisis. That's all that we talk about. Um, but it made me think too that what we need is more James Bonds. We need people that in the most improbable of situations use their tools and gadgets in unexpected ways, solving the problem then and there, and very importantly, at a low cost. Today, we will hear from one, one such person, and by the third Conservation Optimism Summit, I hope that there will be many more. Alex. Introducing me, I was like, wow, I finally made it. Uh, this is a person I have admired since I was actually a student um, and going to my first SCB meeting, so it's an incredible honor. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, I, you know, I too am a conservation optimist, but I used to also say I was the last person you want to invite to dinner, because uh, I essentially am an extinction biologist. I study and try to understand why species go extinct and others uh, survive. Uh, and it was this interest in extinction that has really got me to think about how do we end it? How do we end human-induced extinction? And then what do we have available to us? And if you think about conservation, a lot of conservation has been about this idea of a return to Arcadia, a return to utopia in terms of what we're doing. Humans were bad for nature. To save nature, you remove humans. And we have these awesome things called national parks, protected areas, other measures. And if we look at the trends, those trends have gone up exponentially. 
But the question is, how are we actually doing? How have we done? And the fact is, we know that we're in the sixth mass extinction. Now, this is electron conservation optimism. So my 20 super depressing slides I took out of the presentation uh, for your sake, because I believe that much as we have created these problems, right, and much as we have used food security and inputs and pesticides to protect a billion people from going hungry and dying due to Norman Borlaug, just as we created plastics to allow us to, to create our society, we now need to create whole new pathways to industrialization, and we have the capability of doing that. Um, one of the areas, and, and we have one of the greats of conservation technology in the audience who will be on a panel later, Alison Davies, who's here, uh, is this idea of conservation technology that can give us hope, I think, in conservation. And one of the ways that we have seen this happen is through monitoring and the basic idea that if we can measure it, we can improve it. The first and the most powerful, one of the first and most powerful tools we have are, of course, the cell phones that you have in your own pocket. And they've allowed things like iNaturalist, which was created by a guy named Scott Laurie, who is a student at Duke, uh, to, to now have over 25 million, close to 26 million observations on that platform. Those observations and tools also like eBird are not just you know, nice to have, but they've allowed us to understand things like the global bird migration and where those birds are actually settling in on which fields at which times of day so we can actually pay farmers to actually flood those fields or leave those fields fallow for an extra week as opposed to having to buy the land. We can be more efficient with our conservation dollars. And that's pretty incredible. We have whole new tools available to us, like AudioMoth and Shaw Selby, who's to open field kit, that give us the ability to create, as Shaw calls it, a connected ecosystem or a system of Earth things, an internet of Earth things around what we're doing. And this is Shaw here. Obviously, new tools that allow us to do this at the local level, at the meta level, both underwater and above water, uh, as well as on the planetary level. And my, my friends created this organization called Planet Labs, and they realized one thing, that we didn't have to accept the NASA model, right? Which was, it took 10 years and about $950 million to put lands at eight into space. When you spend a billion dollars on a satellite, you're going to make sure everything works, which means by the time you start building it, you will not change the technology that you put into it. Everything has been space certified. So by the time we said they went into space, it was a decade out of date. It was cutting edge technology at the beginning, but not later. The guys at Planet Labs who literally, you know, who were all working at NASA, who had started in, in their backyard, said, why are we building bespoke technology? Instead of a single satellite that circles the world every two weeks at 30 meter resolution, 15 meter panchromatic, let's actually build small nano satellites. Let's, let's actually have a system that encircles the Earth of these satellites and have the Earth turn within it, which gives you three meter resolution of the entire planet every day. What was different was two things. One is those satellites cost $40,000 to make because they use the same technology in your cell phone. As they don't stay up in Earth as long as they fall out of low Earth orbit, every new satellite that comes up, there's 17K to launch, 40K, not million to, to make, right? Every new satellite actually has new technology as your cell phone is increasing. So that system is actually getting better over time. And it gives us the ability to understand the changes on our planet much more so. And then we have new tools, whole new planets, the Global Force Watch, Global Planetary Watch, you know, the systems that we're using to understand illegal fishing, there are multiples of them across this planet, uh, the UN system of MapX, that allow us to actually understand in detail and then have actual information that comes out. This is amazing. This is amazing new tools that we have available to us. Um, and then added on top of this has been the growth of artificial intelligence, machine vision, and robotics. And what those things do is give us leverage, right? Because as individual conservation scientists, there were never enough of us. 
that understand the changes that are taking place. We have barely scratched the surface of assessing the majority of the species on this planet for their conservation status. We don't know. So what could we do? And my, this is an organization I'm on the board of uh, and help out a lot called Wild Meat. Uh, they started, they work across a wide variety of species, uh, but they started with uh, one uh, group which was whale sharks and whaleshark.org that you can go to. And what it was, was prior to their existence, there was 300 known whale sharks, uh, whale sharks known in the sun. So 300 individuals, you identify them from the cabin of spots on their back, which are unique uh, characteristics of them. Yeah. And uh, the founders of whaleshark.org, which was Brad Norman, who was a uh, whale shark biologist out of Australia, uh, and Jason Holmberg, who was the chief database scientist for Dell Computers, as well as uh, a mathematician from the University of Illinois and a NASA scientist, had taken essentially the NASA StarCam, which was a 1950s algorithm of how satellites find themselves in space, which is kind of hard to do when you're not on the planet, uh, using the pattern of stars, and applied that to whale sharks and allowed citizen scientists and divers around the world to upload photos of whale sharks. So that meant this animal, which disappears for long periods of time, that has incredible ranges, that is incredibly hard for any single conservation scientist or team of conservation scientists, to then start collecting data 24 hours a day, seven days a week across the planet. And we then went from 300 well sharks to 3,000 well sharks. Two years ago, they started then actually using machine vision, machine learning, to scrub every YouTube video that is uploaded on the internet. Every single one. And they look for whale sharks. And then they have a bot, a good bot, as opposed to the Russian bots that we have in the United States, to actually then check and determine and ask query, where was this whale shark? Where was it? It's great some metadata through natural language processing. But then to query, where did you see this whale shark? What was the date? What was the information? And check that against the metadata that they have. And they now have surpassed 10,000 whale sharks known to science, again, being monitored over and over again. And uh, you know, you can, you can go up on their whale, web, website and see these animals. They used to have a program, I don't know if they have any more, where you could adopt one for your wife. And every time it was seen, you would get that, that, that update. But the more important thing is if you actually are a citizen scientist, you upload a picture to the site, you get updates on that whale shark. So there's a behavioral feedback as well. This is an incredible, to go from 300 to 10,000 animals and multiple data points per animal is a powerful tool for science. But the question is, is that enough? Right? Is it enough to deal with the extinction crisis and the end of the extinction crisis? And, and for me, my belief is that conservation needs to evolve. And in fact, partly how it needs to evolve is the way that global health has evolved out of the field of tropical medicine. And I'm going to talk about that in a second. But part of what this means is we need to do more than build national parks, which I've done my entire career, including in Afghanistan and Russia, working with uh, Ramafana National Park in Madagascar, working on online tamarins in Brazil. You know, how do we actually think about not just building the parks in protected areas, but eliminating the drivers of extinction themselves? And that takes you into crazy places. It takes you into the sustainable development goals. It takes you into questions like food security or even air conditioning. And this is really important because like in 35 years of the field of at least the, you know, since the Society of Conservation Biology being created, since the biodiversity meetings at the National Academy of Sciences in the US, you know, we spent a lot of time prioritizing which species go extinct? And what is their level of endangerment? We spent a huge amount of time arguing, including this instance, people at this institution, on what are the hotspots that we need to protect? Or what are the landscapes that we need to protect? Or what are the ecosystems that we need to protect? And how do we rank them? But we've never asked, what are the solutions that are the most effective thing to address the drivers and how do we prioritize them? And that should be a question that we should do. Until this point, when someone actually started this study called Drawdown, which was focused on climate change, they said, how do we, which solutions, if implemented, would take the most CO2 out of the atmosphere? 
and how do we rank those interventions? And you can look at the drawdown list online, there's an organization behind it, there's a book. But this changed the thinking around how do we, not just what is best, but really looking, taking an evidence hypothesis driven approach to what things do we need to do. And, and what I argue is we need to think about the same thing for a dry end for a stage. What solutions can we actually come up with that will allow us to address these drivers to have the biggest impetus for extinction? And we've been thinking about this. I also think we've spent a lot of time thinking about incremental solutions, which is fine, right? But if you think about the scaling of the problem, those problems scale exponentially. They scale with things like population growth. They scale with things uh, like our demand for resources, that billions of people are going to want air conditioning and refrigeration around the world, as well as meat and dairy products. Um, so we've got to focus on those things that are uh, revolutionary jumps rather than evolutionary jumps on what we're trying to do. Um, I'll come back to the precautionary principle, but we also need to really think about how we harness human behavior and use behavioral science around the tools that we have. And there's an incredible body of work that has developed in terms of this area. Um, and we've seen this in development, and there are many fields of global health that are 20 years or more ahead of where we are in conservation. So there's an amazing learning opportunity of things that have been tried, failed, tested, and learned from that we can actually borrow. And of course, if we're thinking about technology, we need to think about the same factors that are used in terms of designing your iPhone that you want to think about for designing the tools that we're using in conservation. And ultimately, we have to be optimistic because things like the red list, ironically, in thinking about behavior, drive up demand for the very species we're trying to protect. The concept of the, of the, of the polar bear on the ice flow dissuades people from taking individual action to actually solve climate change problems and conservation problems. So if we're not giving people real opportunities to engage, and we're not giving people real opportunities to be optimistic, like the organizers, like we're all here doing, you know, we're not going to be successful. So this, this meeting, I think, is an incredible meeting. And then I would argue that we need tools and solutions, whether open source or not, that are scalable and financially sustainable, because philanthropy is limited within what we're trying to do. The last thing I'll say is a little bit, um, perhaps controversial, uh, uh, it is that the problem with conservation is that it's filled with people like me, right? Evolutionary biologists, ecologists, behavioral scientists, and that and what we actually need is this development that we saw in global health. Tropical medicine was a, was a field of one discipline, of physicians. And it was not until it started bringing in and evolved into global health and it started bringing in engineers, and anthropologists, and economists, and policy makers, and, and, and entrepreneurs, that we start seeing the incredible gains that we did in the field of global health. And now, many of the leading causes of morbidity and mortality are things like car accidents in, in, in the developing world. So Conservation X Labs was set up as an organization to actually implement a lot of these ideas. And it was based on the work I had done at USAID, uh, which was to set up a DARPA for development, an innovation engine within the agency uh, for international development, a lot of what I had learned. Uh, in particular, we saw it as a way of inventing ways for invention for conservation, of how do we actually improve the speed and efficacy of conservation solutions and ensure that they are financially sustainable and scalable around what we're trying to do. And so we do these types of things. We essentially build things ourselves. We use prizes and challenges. Uh, we also use what's called mass collaboration around our work. Uh, we try to bring some of the best solutions to scale. And then a really important part of it is actually attracting new people, new fields, new disciplines into the field of what was conservation science. So, uh, and then we try to democratize innovation and engineering through a mix of these two things of what we call social product development and traditional engineering.
The other piece that's kind of weird is we're a nonprofit that owns a for-profit beneficiary corporation and we spin out for-profit corporations <coughs> because we believe that without the additional revenue and investment and 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 benefits and focus that that involves, we're not going to get these solutions to scale and they're not going to work. And I'll talk about uh, some of them. So just to talk about sort of directed innovation, this is the work we do ourselves. Uh, I can talk about one thing that we're uh, we're about to release, which is uh, around engineering enforcement. And it's this issue that if you eat seafood, 33% of the seafood that you're eating is not what you think it is, right? If it's red snapper, and in the US, our food and, our food and drug administration defines red snapper as 12 different species, there's an almost 90% chance that you're not getting red snapper in the US. It is very unlikely that you'll actually get it. And it's really hard sometimes to tell what is cotton versus Estelar, which will give you when you're on your, your Tinder day, you know, stomach cramps and potentially rat diarrhea, not what you really want in that situation. <laughs> what is grouper versus Nile perch? And we heard last night about Darwin's Nightmare. It is, Nightmare is an incredible movie to see. It is probably the most, it's the first movie I ever went to for the entire audience side at the same time. It's just a movie. It is, it, is, it is a super long, uh, depressing movie, uh, but, but, but it's, it's so worth it. It is a really good understanding of the Nile Perch. Uh, swordfish, for whether this is swordfish or mako shark, which whose fishery is now being destroyed. You know, are you getting red snapper or are you getting rockfish, which in many, in some species of rock, rockfish live uh, 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 50 plus years uh, and, and, and are in danger thinking about what we need to protect. The problem with seafood fraud is it makes destructive fishing profitable. It undercuts what we do as conservationists. It hurts consumer-driven innovations, like, and it harms consumers themselves, right? You can get severe toxic fish that are put into the mix that are actually harmful to consumers, or fish that have certain types of bacteria, or fish like Escalar that are not good for your stomach gut that we have a hard time for. And then 90% of the seafood in the U.S. is imported, less than 1% in the U.S. is actually inspected. And generally, inspectors have about 30 minutes to make a decision whether they can hold a ship in, in terms of what they want. And what that means is we can't use labs like this. <clears throat> we can't use, you know, DNA labs with well-trained people, well-equipped with with reagents. And this is especially true if you're talking about fish traceability in countries that have less resources. If you're, if you're talking about fish that are being bought by Thai Union at the point of care. And it doesn't matter how much blockchain you have in the mix, because if it's garbage going in, that is what is being sold. And in fact, NSC has had problems with the amount of the, the actual identification tools for their fish uh, in the past. And what I wanted was something that worked for my son, who's the guy that's holding up the, the magnifying glass. So what works for a four-year-old? What tool would be accessible for anyone to be able to, to, to use for fish traceability? Um, and we wanted something that reminded people of things that they were actually able to use, which was a, a game controller or a Nintendo Switch that was cartridge-based, so you could not only use it for the fish species of your choice, but you could use it for wildlife trafficking or timber trafficking or, or invasive species detection or a whole other set of things that could subsidize these conservation applications which in our case is looking for black mold because we get hit by hurricanes all the time or looking for bed bugs in, in Donald Trump's hotels in Florida that what we're going to put the G7 or you know, name your choice of application, whether something is vegan or halal or kosher, those are all capabilities. We don't have to develop them, but we can create a platform that subsidizes what we are doing in conservation to be able to do that. And we also wanted to build something that costs in the hundreds of dollars uh, that cost dollars or less per test. That was pocket size, that was robust, that was battery power, and that was rapid. 30 minutes, we're hoping for 15 minutes, and that you didn't have to be literate to be able to use. So the move from someone with a P 
PhD in bioinformatics to be able to give anyone, including my son, the ability to use it. And in fact, this was really inspired by my wife, who, who, um, who uh, is the one who actually fixes everything in our house. Uh, and so she does it by looking at YouTube videos. So we got the idea, let's actually have the instructions through a video with no text that just shows you how to use the device as you're using the device and make it as simple as possible. Uh, and to go from sample prep to amplification to detection. So we don't do whole genome sequencing, that's what Oxymanopore does, which is uh, a different model for how to do it. But what we do is we use the DNA barcode library of 500,000 species that has already been developed by people like the University of Guelph, and we compare it your sample against a known set of samples that you're testing for on the cartridge. Uh, and these are the markets that, that we think we can address that are big problems, but they're also big markets, so they attract the investors, uh, and that we can do it. I can't show a picture of the device because we're in the process of patenting uh, everything, but we're hoping to actually have testable models for people to use by, by early spring of next year. Uh, we just completed the last sort of technological hurdle. Uh, around it. Uh, we can think about how we replace the extinction drivers. And one of the companies we work with uh, deals with this problem. If you actually eat shrimp, and I used to eat a lot of shrimp, I love shrimp. Uh, you'll see this. This is a picture my wife took of the mosquito coast in Nicaragua. I know we had uh, a workshop on this on Nicaragua last week. This is in Bluefield, so if you guys know, know the region. But this is, uh, this is the uh, this is the bycatch, all the stuff that's thrown away, and this is the shrimp that's kept. It's generally about 15 to 20 pounds per pound of shrimp. So that has a huge effect on a fishery or an ecosystem. And one of the companies we've supported and been working with is New Way Foods, which is a company that has made shrimp out of red algae. And it is a fishery biologist from Scripps Oceanographic Institute at UCSD and the material scientists from Carnegie and Mellon, both working together to actually create this product. And what's incredible is that it looks like shrimp, it tastes like shrimp, it almost feels like shrimp. The hardest part in a lot of these uh, new foods is the fact that cellular agriculture is what it's called, is, you know, is the, the texture, is the hardest part, but it is really close, and you can't tell in you know, shrimp fried rice. Cannot tell the difference, but, in, but what you can tell is you have no more bycatch, you have no more slavery, you have no more of the pollution that happens on land-based aquaculture around shrimp. So we have an amazing opportunity to actually rethink the model and give consumers whole different choices. And I think this is one of the things we spend a lot of time doing: is how do we get consumers to make the right choice? And the question I ask is, how do we not get the choice? But replace all the choices, just like every meal we've had so far, as far as I can tell, has been vegan or vegetarian, which is an odd vegetarian and very is, is an awesome thing, right? How do we replace what is available on the shelf around what we're trying to do? We've been working on pangolin. It is a much harder case that it's 20% of global wildlife trade, uh, actually creating synthetic scales, right? It's the same stuff as your fingernails uh, and keratin. Um, uh, we actually spent a lot of time interviewing Chinese authorities, medicinal doctors, uh, medicinal, Chinese medicine patients, understanding the economics of the system. Uh, it is a lot harder to think about whether a replacement works because it's not based on just the efficacy. It is the easiest part of the equation is actually creating a biosimilar. Right? You can create a synthetic product that has the same efficacy, this penguin actually has some efficacy for some of the things that they're doing that achieve that goal. But there's a lot more that needs to go into work in terms of culture to be able to make this work. So this is, this is not a success for us, uh, but it is one where I think it's successful because we learn a lot about what it takes to do things. There's a synthetic bear bottle, for instance, out there, but we were asking, why hasn't that worked? Well, how does it never pass the Chinese, you know, regulatory authority to actually be in them? And that's kind of what it takes to, to be able to ask some of these questions. Another form of replacement we're thinking about is cooling. 
if you look at drawdown, the drawdown for extinction challenge that, that uh, the drawdown for extinction study that I mentioned, the number one thing we can do for climate change is change the technology behind refrigeration and air pollution. So for Rocky Mountain Institute and the Indian government, we ran, we're running a $3 million challenge for a five-fold increase in air pollution. Because there are billions of people who are emerging in the middle class who would want air pollution. That will require any estimate because it will require them to double their subsidy, which is already at $18 billion a year, and double their grid infrastructure. Because grid infrastructure is based on maximum cooling demand. So we're looking at a five-fold increase in room AC. Uh, there's actually a building that we will be testing these air conditioners in using technologies other than vapor compression. Uh, the gases and vapor compression for air conditioning are 20,000 times as powerful as CO2. There's whole new technologies such as magnetic cooling that are out there. We'll be testing these technologies for three months continuously in sensorized rooms. Uh, and this is what is the effect of this. If we can actually get this technology adopted worldwide, which it is better, if it's 500 times more efficient, it is cheaper for the consumer, and it is cheaper for government, so the incentives are there. In India, one of the world's biggest markets, the government is behind us to be able to make this a new regulation. We have the ability to take 100 gigatons to avoid 100 gigatons of emissions, which is equal to about a half to one degree of global warming aversion without the U.S. signing the Paris Accord, which is why we were thinking this. That's a reason to be optimistic. Uh, we're also thinking about how we actually engineer resilience. Uh, places like the coral reefs and the Great Barrier Reefs, we're looking at things like respiration probiotics, both for replacing inputs in agriculture, uh, which there's been a lot of work done, but even the ability to engineer greater resilience around coral reefs around bleaching and dealing particularly with uh, environmental pollutants. It's, it's really hard to do things like acidification, uh, less hard to do warming, uh, but in terms of at least dealing, mitigating the effects of environmental pollution, which adds on top of acidification and warming, we can do things to actually uh, better improve uh, the resilience of it. I want to talk about what we're doing in sort of the use of prizes and challenges. Um, and people know about some types of prizes, like the Nobel Prize. Uh, but the secret is, instead of looking for the needle in the haystack, what we're trying to do is incentivize that needle to find you. And prizes have allowed us to create a whole new industry. The reason we have potentially self-driving cars on the horizon is because DARPA ran a grand challenge for self-driving cars about 10 years ago called the DARPA Grand Challenge. DARPA is the institution in the United States that created things like drones and the internet. Uh, Ortec created a prize that was uh, that Charles Lindbergh won being the first person to fly solo across the Atlantic. Before that date, he was a mail, mail carrier uh, that did stunt flying, <laughs> had never done any, any long distance flying before. Uh, and he won that prize. And then immediately after that prize, we saw the creation of a commercial transatlantic and space uh, airline industry. The Ansari X Prize was the very first X Prize, the X Prize that my co-founder is a former chief scientist at X Prize, that has unleashed private space flight uh, now, which is how NASA is partly getting uh, materials to the International Space Station. Uh, we launched the prize to take fish out of aquaculture feed because how we were feeding fish, farmed fish, which is now 50% of how you get fish, was entirely being fed from wild fish, which was destroying sort of the bottom of the ecosystem, the foundation of, of our fisheries, uh, and rethinking this. And the Department of, of Energy has done uh, prizes around a commercial rooftop cooling system that has actually led to improvements there. But my experience came from launching uh, and creating the grand challenges for development with the Gates Foundation. And this was the very first uh, prize that we ran, which was, which was, because there's a lot of prizes now, so people can be really skeptical, and there's good reasons to be skeptical. But this one was a really simple one. How do we make the difference in where women get birth? Whether, particularly this window between the onset of labor and 48 hours after delivery. How do we make it? Because that's the window that you're most likely to die your children. How do we make the difference of whether you get birth in a hut? or in a hospital irrelevant to your outcome. Because USA, the world's biggest 
bilateral development agency, as well as DFID and Grand Challenges Canada and the Gates Foundation and Norway, we did not have enough money to solve this problem. So we said, we're going to do a prize. Um, and, and what I was told over and over by the people who would say this, we know what all the answers are, we know what all the solutions are, just give us more money. And we said, yeah. And what we started to see were, uh, this has been running for 10 years, but in particular, whole new devices that we had never thought of before. And my favorite is the Odon device. It's the first device for obstructed labor in 40 years. It's developed by a car mechanic in Argentina who saw a YouTube video of how a cork falls into a bottle, how do you actually use reverse pressure to get the cork out, and said, oh God, literally in the middle of the night, and said, we can use this for obstructed labor. I don't know why. We went to the home health agency and, and actually went to them and said, what do we do? And they go, I don't know, but there's this thing called saving lives at birth, apply to it. Well, they applied, they actually made a prototype, they won, it is now, they won a second round of scale-up funds and it is now licensed to Beckman Dickinson, a medical manufacturing company that's trying to spread it worldwide. The Pratt Couch is just another one. This was, uh, if you have uh, HIV or a mother that has HIV, you don't want to pass HIV to your children, you need to take antiretroviral drugs, you need a cold chain for those drugs that doesn't work for the last mile for most people. What this does is it looks like a ketchup packet and it costs a couple of pennies and it, it eliminates the need for refrigeration for those drugs. Uh, you can store it for up to a year, you can store it in a wide variety of environmental conditions. You don't need refrigeration because you just don't have that in the places where we actually need this drug. What was incredible was it came from undergrads at Duke in an engineering class. These are solutions that never came to USA before. 50% of our solutions came from the developing world. A whole significant amount of solutions came from people who had never approached our agency before. And then we started seeing other things. We started seeing our gender ratios balance out. The number of inventors between men and women equalized. We started seeing huge amounts of leverage that were both put into it as well as other development agencies working with us. Uh, and we could track it to 10,000 lives being saved over the course of these grand challenges. So I believe in this model, which is why we ran the Blue uh, Economy Challenge, uh, which we saw ideas from 71 countries for a very technical challenge, which was replacing the protein source in aquaculture feed. Um, just so they, and, and the other thing prices and challenges do is they actually give you an innovation landscape map of where all the innovations are. So even if people didn't apply, you have a sense of where they might be other innovations to look at. We saw companies that are picking, uh, turning CO2 and methanol and ethanol into protein sources. We saw people doing marine permaculture arrays, actually doing large kilometer square arrays to grow seaweed that becomes protein sources for aquaculture and fisheries. We saw people developing algae as protein sources. We started seeing uh, terrestrial aquaculture units that clean the water coming out of the aquaculture ponds that are nutrient rich, growing the algae as a protein source that goes back closer to a closed loop system that we actually need. Most recently, we've been looking at water conservation uh, and biodiversity conservation. That's a huge space. Uh, we spent two years mapping uh, and interviewing hundreds of experts for this problem landscape. And we settled on an issue that is very much in the news. Uh, this is from yesterday, um, which is on artisanal scale mining uh, that we're about to launch on October 2nd. And, and you might think, why is small scale mining an issue? Well, just in terms of gold, uh, third, mercury is used in artisanal scale mining. The mercury in artisanal scale mining is responsible for 37% of global mercury emissions. So the mercury that's bioaccumulating in your fish is the mercury that might be coming from these mining sites. And it's also used for things like coltan that are used in the capacitors in your cell phones, in your computers, in your DVD players, uh, along with gold. Uh, it's a huge industry. Um, it's 20% of global diamonds, 20% of gold, 78% of gemstones, a whole set of metals. Are uh, our, our mined artisanally, uh, and they can create uh, huge amounts of habitat loss. So this this picture right here is actually of an area between Manu National Park in, in Peru and Madidi National Park in Bolivia, which is some of the 
species in the world. Uh, those plums are all filled with mercury and water because that's the process that they use. There's huge human health impacts about it and it's massive deforestation. Uh, so we believe that there are solutions that will allow us to prevent the inputs of uh, some of these toxic chemicals that allow us to reduce the amount of, of, of degradation to the environment, to reform the supply chains and have better data to understand what's happening with people's health and global health. Uh, and we're giving $750,000 away. Uh, and the other thing I'm really happy about is that we have all of the major conservation organizations as partners, which is something that happens way, way too rarely uh, on these things. Um, we, next year, we'll be launching, hopefully, uh, a challenge around microplastics, uh, transforming microplastics and replacing sources at scale uh, that we want to take on. We're seeing increasingly this is a big issue. Uh, but the, the problem with crisis and challenges is that you have way more ideas than just those, those ideas that we And so we started saying, how do we actually capture and build many of those solutions that didn't just win the prize, but that had promise? How do we build communities of practice around what we're doing? We've been working on something called a digital makerspace to take this on, uh, to create a platform where people can actually come up with an idea, build a team around some of that idea. Still a lot of work to do around it. But some of the ideas that have come through this include the use of AI to follow chips that are being trafficked on, on the internet. Cargo screen is a way of actually better, to better understanding wildlife trade, uh, in international trade, new tagging, low-cost tagging systems for, for marine mammals, uh, as well as sharks, and people thinking about how we transform things like camera traps, which I know a lot of people are working on. Uh, but the incredible thing has been just the number of projects that people have been able to develop. And then we've been working to try to bring as many of those uh, to scale. Uh, in particular, we've been giving away small amounts of money to allow people to just test our ideas. And all you need is an idea. So, you know, give us some ideas. We'll give you $3,500 to build a prototype. You build a small prototype. We'll give you 20k to, to, to move to the next level. And then we'll help invest. Uh, more money and more resources behind some, some of the better ideas that are out there. But more recently, we've been trying to say, how do we automate the process of innovation? How do we actually use peer advising by the people who didn't win with the people who did? How do we actually bring the best of those ideas together? Um, how do we help with missing expertise on films? How do we write algorithms that allow us to do that? How do we measure complementarity of expertise? How we test how this works. This is all work we're doing with Carnegie Mellon. And then lastly, we think it is really important to bring engineers into conservation. And we held this event last year in, 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 in Borneo, in Malaysia and Borneo, which was an engineering competition around our oceans uh, with teams that were specifically only from, the, from, from that part of the world, so essentially from Southeast Asia. Because we wanted people closest to the problem to have the ability to be inspired and incentivized to create solutions to those problems. Uh, because we think this is where conservation needs to go. We think it is that evolution from tropical medicine into this much more diverse field that I think can take on these problems, replace the underlying drivers of extinction around what we're trying to do. Uh, I'm going to just close on this. This is the national park I helped build in Afghanistan. There's now four national parks in Afghanistan. Uh, it just celebrated its 10th year anniversary. I wrote a book about the story of which go, and the resources go back to that part. Um, but what is incredible to me is that there are 200,000 visitors a year to that national park, and they're 99% Afghan. And that is hope that within a war zone, within a place that people think is hopeless, that you can have a conservation success. We can have a conservation success in the place. Yes, yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Uh, we have time for a few questions. I see one back over there by the wall. The microphone better so that people uh, were streaming can hear. Thank you for your talk.
simultaneously with this called the Good Food Institute, uh, the Good Food Conference, which is all cellular uh, and plant-based uh, meat products, right? Uh, that is going on right now in San Francisco. Uh, and the opportunities are huge, right? We know about the Impossible Burger and Beyond, Beyond Beef, but there's other uh, products. I remember the old name is Moo Free, but I think it's um, it has a different name now. Uh, which is, uh, you know, it's a milk product that is indistinguishable from milk, except they've taken out the, the bad, it doesn't have cause brucellosis, they've taken out the high cholesterol, and they've taken out the lactose, uh, and, and but it's brewed like beer, because uh, we brew beer from microorganisms, you can brew milk from microorganisms. Same thing with a lot of these meat products. I think there is enormous progress. They taste amazingly fantastic, uh, both the plant-based and the cellular agriculture products. There are chicken replacements. The hardest piece is the texture, creating muscle, the, the matrix in which these things are being built. <coughs> but there's a lot of money uh, going in. I can't remember if it's Impossible Burger or Beyond Beef. One of the two just had a massive, uh, they opened up for investment and it, it blew through any of their expectations. So it's gross. The, it's growing huge. The, the challenge is the, the meat farmers, right? The people who deal with livestock, right? And the, the, the issue there is that they are fighting this tooth and nail. France, I think, has passed regulations to prevent uh, any cellular meat product to be called meat. Uh, in the U.S., there is a huge uh, fight against this. People may remember Oprah Winfrey, who is a U.S. television character and billionaire. She, uh, you know, advocated the people to, to become vegan as the best thing to do for the planet on her show. She was sued and lost that lawsuit by the U.S. Cattlemen's Association. So part of, I think, what has to happen is there's kind of three three stages. One is we've got to transform the existing animal husbandry effort, which means transforming feed. A lot of the aquaculture products that I'm talking about are products that could actually be used to replace protein in animal feed as well as for aquaculture feed. Protein is protein. As long as you're meeting the nitronutrients and the, the price point, which we did, that was part of our challenge, you can do that. Uh, thinking about water, thinking about inputs, thinking about food waste has to be part of that solution. The second is actually creating the products that people want. And the great thing about New Wave Foods is they're just selling to campuses, right? Because campuses in the U.S. compete for students based on things like food, right? If you're, bless you, if you're coming in three times, if you're coming in and you are, uh, you, you are, uh, you know, you're looking at different campuses. Having legitimate vegan options is a competitive advantage. So they're selling thousands of pounds a month of their product entirely to universities, and that's the next generation. So that gives me hope, right? And and so the, so and then I think the the third part is just just thinking about how we educate. Uh, people and, and expand it, but it'll be a generational change that will have, and I'm oh, sorry, the third part is this, is people's livelihoods are dependent on cattle in the developing world in here. Like if you think of, one of the problems I have with conservation is it's frequently not science-based. And, and environmentalism, I should say, more so than conservation. So when we look at small-scale farmers, this is a very unpopular view. I'm about to make myself super unpopular. They are actually less climate resilient and not, per acre less good for wildlife and in terms of food productivity. I don't want to see the loss of the Amazon basin and the loss of the Congo basin, which is what 9.8 billion people on this planet will meet just based on growth rates. So we need to really increase the efficiency of those systems. The reason we don't, and the reason USAID and others invest in the international, in small scale farmers, is because we don't want to deal with the social and economic and political consequences of those being people being disenfranchised. So we've got to solve that part of the equation. 
education. Sorry, that was a super long answer, but it's a really important point, and it's one of the biggest areas. The other challenge we really want to do is food waste, and there's, you know, we're a little torn because there's a lot of work being done, but the one great thing about challenges is it attracts investors, it raises awareness, it inspires people to go into these areas, it builds communities, and that's useful beyond just the solutions around what we're doing. Look at one here, then one over there, and one over here. We have three. Um, thanks for your talk. It was really eye-opening. Um, I was wondering, do you think um, the more difficult part is coming up with a really innovative idea or implementing that idea? Uh, so obviously implementing an idea is the hardest part, as Megan can tell you. Uh, who's doing key conservation here and is amazing. Uh, just shout out for key conservation. But uh, the, um, it's hard, right? Like entrepreneurship is really hard. So it's really easy for me to be at USAID and give away $20 billion a year uh, to like give it all up and start from scratch and create an organization when you have kids. Uh, was absolutely, it's still absolutely terrifying, right? And it's, it's, but it's also like the great part of entrepreneurship is you get to choose which 90 hours of the week you work. So you have that incredible flexibility. But, the, but, the, the other, the, but it is really hard. Now, innovation itself, people tend to think that innovation actually happens in these massive leaps. But in fact, one of the things we've learned from the science of innovation is it happens through inspiration from people looking at examples in adjacent spaces. Like you can find a lot of our innovations are actually coming from people working in other fields who have solved a similar type of a problem and applying that solution in an in a novel way. And that gives us that gives us hope. So Kip Bio, Kip Bio, which is now FDA approved to sell to aquaculture facilities, started by you know producing ethanol and then decided to actually go into something greener because that was more aligned with the mission that they wanted to have, which is then to produce protein, which I think is is better. You can you can be inspired by bits and pieces of ideas, uh, and it's shown that that actually has a lot to do with. You can apply things. Great leaps and bounds can actually happen not through great leaps and bounds, but it looks like great leaps and bounds at the outside of the process. But I definitely think, I think the, the doing of it is the harder piece for sure. So the last two questions was one over there and one here. <coughs> Uh, you gave some really cool examples of technology being, or kind of enabling monitoring of, of wildlife. So I'm a behavioral scientist, and so the thing that springs to my mind is how can technology be used to monitor behavior? So can it help us measure behavioral outcomes that we wouldn't otherwise be able to see? Yeah, I think, um, <coughs> obviously there is lots of work, your iPhone, your Fitbit, all these devices that we have, uh, your, the Apple Watch, uh, have all these applications to help you lose weight, to help you uh, do a number of other things. It would be really good to have those things to actually modify your behavior in different ways. And, and you know, the same tools that you use to measure your number of calories per day should, could really easily be converted to measure your CO2 uh, footprint. Or, you know, a greener Yelp, uh, which uh, a friend of mine has been working on developing can actually help you make better choices as to understanding uh, the choices of what restaurant to go to, or even really basic things of just, you know, I have a terrible carbon footprint. Um, I have a, you know, I wish I could have taken a sailboat over here because I'm a sailor as well, but the, the, you know, the thought is like, there are actually choices you can make on air flights. If you take a Dreamliner, it is a much more efficient plane than a 740 older 747, being able to have things that help you do that calculation are actually useful things to change the choices that you make, and then the whole field of behavioral science to nudge you into thinking about what you are doing and being aware of what you're doing and understanding the implications of that. I think all of that, all of that is possible, and I don't think we've scratched the surface what we do. What we tend to do in conservation that, that bothers me the most is we ask those people closest to the problem, 
who live in the places that are biodiverse to bear the greatest cost of conservation while we go through our day in day lives using our phones and our computers, which I'm addicted to, and living the lifestyles that we have and not making the challenges that we ask the other people to make. So we clearly need to think about ways of helping transferring the benefit of conservation to the people on the ground, and I think technology can help that, and then helping change our behaviors to be able to match you know, that, whatever it, it may be. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, I think you mentioned it a lot at the beginning of your presentation, and it reminded me of like programs that had come out like Cowspiracy, and the whole idea like people can't feel like they are the problem. Like you said, they need to feel like they're part of the solution. Like you couldn't shame someone to go to the gym, it wouldn't work. You need to make them feel like they're part of the solution. So in terms of the prizes that you said and the competitions, I feel like in terms of like Nike had their campaign, this girl can like, marketing obviously has a power to do a lot and branding can change a lot and i was thinking has has it already happened or has has anyone thought of the idea of approaching this in terms of like a whole campaign to actually like make people feel like give them ways in, of thinking how they can be part of the solution because just being here in this room for one hour I was like, oh, okay, I didn't know a lot of my meat was mislabeled, and I didn't know that there's so much bycatch and that I am a part of this solution. So I think there's a lot of social media agencies that exist now, and the incentive of you could win this amount of money for creating this branding campaign that is meant to affect people on all various types of platforms could be very impactful. So I was like, a question slash statement. No, I, I totally agree, and I think this is a lot of, like, half of our like half our work is building stuff ourselves and spitting it out and hoping that will result in change. And that takes a lot of effort, uh, as you point, point out. The other half of the work is how do we create those venues for people to be the true James Bonds of what, what we're doing? Because the world needs conservation superheroes. And, and that's why we're like, all you need is, an, for the most lowest level of what we're doing, all you need is an idea. Just give us an idea. Particularly, it tends to be around you know, building a prototype. That's our focus and fixture. But we want to give people that opportunity. And then you know, that changes identity. That changes how people see themselves. And that is actually one of those powerful motivators that you can have. So I, I totally agree. I think marketing, conservation marketing, is a really important new field that we're starting to see. The behavior change is a really important new field. Technology is not the solution, but it helps us achieve some of this, so there's some great opportunities. Julia's getting up, so I think I got that. Thank you. Yeah. So thank you. <laughs>